Cool. I'm Satchel. I'm the head of engineering at Aloft. Um, and I graduated from here, from Webb, which felt like only a few years ago, but at dinner with some of these <laughs> freshman students the other night, I was reminded that they were all born after 2000 and were 10 when I graduated. So that, that put me on the back foot a little bit. Uh, but here we go. Uh, since most of you are freshmen, you haven't been around for a season of web thesis presentations, but I'm going to give you a little preview of what it looks like. The first slide is always an intro, and the second slide is always an agenda. So just be prepared for that. You know what's coming. Um, purpose of this presentation is to talk about how wind propulsion can be used to partially or completely decarbonize the offshore wind construction industry, right? We're putting in a lot of effort to build turbines uh, to produce renewable energy. We're still using fossil fuel powered ships to do that. And that's, you know, right now that's an imperative, but as we look forward, how can we make, that in, make and improve that process? So first I'm gonna start by talking about the Jones Act fleet because it's actually more interesting than you're led to believe by the news media. Uh, we're going to talk about offshore wind construction and how that's accomplished, the different vessel types it takes, because obviously there are a lot of naval architects in the room, and then operational profiles and the importance of understanding that before doing this type of analysis, ports and wind farm locations, types of wind propulsions, and then the actual way that I perform this analysis to come to the conclusions that we get at the end. And then also because there's students here, I crowdsource some life advice from classmates and, and other recent web graduates. So hopefully, hopefully I don't run too far over on time. So first, a little bit about me. I put this picture up here partially because it's how I got into wind propulsion. Um, that's Figaro 2. Some of you, Web has one now. Some of you have raced on one. That's out west uh, in Seattle. I did a race to Alaska twice. And the rule of that race is you're not allowed to have an engine on the boat. It's 750 miles. And I survived, obviously. <laughs> But the really interesting thing is after a couple of days of not having an engine, you become very comfortable with wind power alone. And that's part of what inspired me to work on bringing back wind propulsion to the maritime industry. Yeah. However, we, did, we didn't have a diesel engine. We did have another type of engine. These are four. The, the other rule of the race is you're allowed human propulsion. So that's a younger me with shorter hair um, and some other guys working on fixing our pedal propulsion system which we got a lot of help from Jamie Swan and the engineering of. Um, four people, we generated about one horsepower and could move the boat at four knots, which is pretty, pretty good. We hired four cyclists to just, just to pedal, and then we had four sailors to actually sail the boat. D you know, good division of labor, economies of scale, and that's what it looks like when you're pedaling in the rain in Alaska um, at night. So maybe engines have a purpose. Let's look at some hybrid wind uh, engine solutions. So after graduating from Webb, I worked as a consulting engineer for four years. And then I went to a shipyard in Seattle, Vigor Industrial, and worked on the Washington State Ferries Vessel Electrification Program, which is a really fascinating project that they're hopefully building a ship in Washington soon. But the engineering is all good. Um, and you're going to hear more about that in a presentation later this afternoon. If you can make it, Eileen Tausch from Crowley worked on that project with me. And after that, I went on to co-found a law, which is a startup focused on bringing wind propulsion to the U.S. Jones Act market. We like to say that we're giving wind propulsion a second wind, because as you probably know, for most of human history, ships were completely powered by wind. The fuel propulsion area is actually a really small fraction. Um, and yeah, we're looking at the Jones Act fleet because there's no wind propulsion solutions that target that today. And because it's kind of special as we're going to, we're going to talk about, you all know what it is, but in, in what the Jones Act means, but I just wanted to put up this chart with the number of vessels to give you an idea kind of how the fleet is distributed. This is from a UMass study, which I'm happy to share. As you can see. <laughs> Barges are, you know, pretty much the number one thing. So if you're excited about working on barges, there's plenty of, plenty of work for you in the industry. Um, you can also see that ocean-going self-propelled vessels above 1,000 gross tons 
is not the biggest segment of the Jones Act fleet. So we're focused on the vessels that do exist in the U.S. and how we can use wind propulsion to, to address those. Please, at the end, don't ask me about the railroad car ferries and where 569 of those are, because I have still to this day no idea. So looking at the fleet in another way, by number of vessels, CO2 impact, and dead weight, you can see that container ships are a tiny segment in terms of vessels, but a very large impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. That's primarily because they're fast and they're some of the, as you can see, dead weight, they're, they're large. Fishing vessels, there's a ton, but they are all very, very small, resulting in a similar CO2 impact, though, because they're less efficient. Uh, we're gonna, for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus on the offshore segment in the magenta, or that's Tug's offshore in the purple, sorry, um, because that's what work, is doing work in the offshore wind industry. All right, so why offshore wind? Because this is the biggest new market to utilize vessels in a different way in the U.S. in our lifetimes, right? Um, the federal government has established that Jones Act applies to most vessels working in the offshore wind industry, because as soon as you install a turbine or any sort of foundation on the continental shelf, that becomes a U.S. port and anything carried between the U.S. port and the turbine is required to be carried on a Jones Act vessel. And then there's a separate state requirements. Most states, New York especially, want to get the most economic benefit from the dollars that they're investing in these wind farms. So they are driving companies to manufacture the turbines and components and possibly even foundations locally, which means stuff made in the U.S. going to a U.S. port, that's going on a Jones Act ship. All right, this is a pretty simplistic graphic of an offshore wind farm. Has anybody been out to see the Block Island Farm in coastal Virginia? Nice. I have. That's cool. Um, some t at some point in the future, you will all be able to see wind farms a lot more frequently. Uh, but yeah, so far we have seven turbines in the U.S. with Vineyard Wind starting installation this fall. So I want to talk about how the construction process actually progresses here. And we're focused on fixed bottom installation wind turbines. Floating is a whole other ballgame and a very different installation process. So the first step is typically survey. Um, trying to understand the bottom topography and the sediment conditions, because that really defines how much it costs and what type of foundation structure can be used. The second step is typically the onshore substation, that's the orange box, and then pulling the cable out to the offshore substation so that they can start commissioning those really complicated electronic stuff. And the array cable, the array export cable, sorry, the export cable shown in blue, the array cables are in yellow. So the export cable carries all of the power from the farm to the grid. The array cables just carry one or a, a group of turbine um, power levels. So the, the export cable is much larger, much trickier to lay, and has much more um, finicky bend radius, which makes laying it and pulling it up into the station challenging. Um, so you've got the substations in, then you put the foundations for the actual turbines in, pull the array cables up into the foundation and then put the turbine on top. So actually the, the part you see, the installation of the wind turbine is pretty much the final step. All right, naval architecture, let's talk about some vessels. There are a shocking number of vessels required to complete an offshore wind installation. We've, I've got a list of them here. I'm gonna go through them all individually. They're kind of ranked in order of increasing size. So crew transfer vessels are the smallest, wind turbine vessels are the largest. That's the order we're going to go through them. Uh, the quantities on this graphic on the low end, if you have good eyesight, that's number of vessels per project. And there's on the East Coast, there's about 14 projects planned or in construction now. So as you can see, like that's a lot of, a lot of vessels needed. All right, crew transfer vessels. These are fast catamarans. They take people from shore out to the site every day and back or between vessels in the field. It's kind of like a taxi service or Uber for wind farms. Uh, there are actually some companies looking into using ground effect craft for this purpose because they can ignore right whale speed restrictions. I don't have any more information about that. 
Google it. Um, these are typically aluminum, very similar to ferries. And there are six or so of these under construction today because we kind of understand their needs and they're pretty universal. Survey vessels. Uh, this is a company, this is a vessel that actually does wind farm survey pretty frequently. There's two types of survey, geophysical and geotechnical. And I can never tell you which one's which, but I think I've got it right. So try. Um, one of the first one is taking core samples, right? Literally, they drive a pipe into the ground, pull a core out, and that tells them about the sediment properties at different depths. The second is using sonar and boomers to essentially create a map of the sediment properties. And the reason you need to do both is because the sonar boomers approach gives you relative sediment densities and properties. And then you take a core in a couple of places and you can pin down those things specifically. Uh, the vessels that are doing coring spend a lot of time stationary coring. The vessels towing sonar are moving around. Typically at pretty low speeds, just, you know, they call it transects, but it's driving back and forth. All right, next type of vessel increasing in size, offshore supply vessels. These are literally just oil patch assets that are being redeployed to work in wind farms, either as a survey platform when they load out with all the specialized survey gear, um, just carrying stuff out to the wind farm and back. You know, the way it's been explained to me is some days the contractor forgets their tools at home and somebody has to go get them. And it takes a 200 foot boat. Um, they also can be set up to install the transition pieces or grouting the connection between the transition piece and the foundation. In general, when they're working near a turbine, they have to be dynamically positioning like DP2 rated to be able, allowed to work close to that asset, obviously because of the failure modes. And then they also carry the bubble curtain, which we're gonna talk about. Sounds like sci-fi, but we're gonna talk about that in a minute. All right, service operating vessels. This is like a bigger OSV that serves as a wind farm hotel. If you, 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 know, you put the crew on a two week rotation, the vessel spends its whole time in the farm. So no time is lost to transit. Uh, it also has a really fancy platform gantry or gangway system so that you can walk to work. It's often called a walk to work vessel. There are also a couple of these in construction because they're used over the entire life of the wind farm to do commissioning, installation, and then maintenance as the wind farm progresses. It's also dynamically positioned, obviously. Okay, cable laying, the name of the vessel says it all. What's, what's much more interesting is how the cable gets to the bottom, gets buried, um, and also actually how the cable gets from the factory and onto the ship, but that's a whole nother presentation, so. Yeah. If you're interested in that, find me or Google. Um, these aren't stationary, but they move very slowly. This vessel maybe lays two to four miles of cable in a day. So very low speeds. There are a lot of guard vessels used. These are primarily just repur repurposed fishing boats um, as a way for the offshore wind developers to gain favor with the fishing industry. They hire them and their boats to mostly just sit around looking for uh, protecting the area around cable laying or other sensitive operations from recreational boats or commercial ships that are straying into the area. Um, rock dumping. Some of these vessel names are pretty, pretty wild and very specific. This is being built at Philly Shipyard. If you're going there this winter, it would be, it's not under construction yet, but maybe you'll get to work on it. Uh, for the Great Lakes Dredge and Dry Dock Company, I think the best way to describe it is it's the opposite of dredging. It puts material on the bottom. The purpose is to surround the tower with rocks that won't get scoured away by ocean currents. All right, foundation installation vessels. Now we're getting into kind of the large ship style vessel. This is actually dynamically positioned to do the foundation driving. It's a CUA 7 vessel. They also do it with a series of anchors or a jack-up solution, um, but the dynamic positioning allows the vessel to move from foundation to foundation more quickly. Obviously, that crane is enormous, typically 5,000 metric tons or larger. 
They also have a specialized system to take the pile. This is called a, a monopile. It's like a big tube, steel tube section from a flat location, like laying down on the deck and move it to a vertical position so they can drive it. So these are pretty specialized vessels. Uh, we don't have any of these in the U.S. And to avoid the Jones Act requirement here, uh, they have come up with elaborate plans to transport the monopiles either from Europe or from Canada on board these vessels or on board feeder vessels, and then do the installation with a foreign flagged vessel. Okay, and then uh, this is another picture of the foundation, different foundation installation vessel. The, the point of putting this one up there, I mentioned the bubble curtain earlier, right? That's an OSD on the side of the screen. It has a bunch of compressors on the deck and you can see this faint line in the water. If you were here for the presentation this morning, there was a lot of discussion of using bubbles to reduce cavitation noise. We're doing a very similar thing here to dampen the sound from the pile driving operation. The bubble curtain is essentially allows you to drive piles and reduce your impact on marine mammal life. Uh, and basically there's a OSV that goes along and lays the curtain and then another that comes along and connects, provides the bubbles and then they just swap places. Okay, I mentioned feedering. Why feedering? In European construction of offshore wind farms, who are the leader in this industry, they use a wind turbine installation vessel to go into shore, pick up typically three to five sets of turbine components, and then transit out to the wind farm, jack up, install a turbine, jack down, go to the next location, continue. In the US, you need to build a US Jones Act turbine installation vessel to do that same operation. And there's one of those under construction uh, from Dominion. A bunch of developers are using the forcing function of Jones Act requirements to look at a more efficient way to do this installation process, right? This is a very expensive asset. You don't want it spending its time doing something that you could do with, some, with a cheaper thing. You want it just installing turbines, you know, all day, especially because there's limited weather windows and limited seasonality to this work. So what you're seeing here is a Kirby Maersk solution where Maersk is going to build the wind turbine installation vessel foreign flag. And Kirby is going to build a US flagged Jones Act ATB. There's a really cool video of this online. You can find it. The barge actually gets lifted up into a notch with kind of a ship lift dry dock solution so that the lift from of those components um, is happening between two fixed objects. And it's very challenging to lift from a fixed object off of a floating barge when you have motions moving the barge around, right? You, you start picking up the weight with the crane and then the barge moves up and faster than the crane lifts and the weight comes back down on the barge and chaos ensues. There's another feedering solution that's being deployed for Vineyard Wind, the leading US commercial project from FOSS and DEMI. Um, this is a barge with a six axis compensated, motion compensated platform under the components. So that basically matches the, the motion with the fixed platform. So effectively the tower and the nacelle and the blades aren't moving relative to the jack up rig. That reduces the danger of the lift. So these are the, these are the options. That's all for vessel types. Oh, there's the wind turbine installation vessel. This is a foreign flagged one. You can see they've carried out four towers um, and are performing the installation. Dominion is building a U.S. flag vessel to do just that in the U.S. So we'll see whether feedering or shuttle using the wind turbine installation vessel takes off. Okay, on to the other wind. Now we've talked about how to build the wind farm. Let's talk about how to use wind propulsion on those vessels. There's three big types of wind propulsion. The first is Flettner rotors. Uh, the second is the suction sail, and we'll get to the third on the next slide. So Flettner rotors and suction sails both use some small percentage of input power to increase the amount of thrust you get from a fixed area sail. On the Flettner rotor, the whole rotor spins, and it uses the Magnus effect to increase the lift. And you should, when you get to fluid mechanics, you should ask Prof Rice to explain that. Um, it's, it's wild. 
Suction sails do a similar thing called boundary layer control. They use a fan inside to attach the boundary layer on the low pressure side. So they can use a thicker section and generate more lift. And then the third technology that's being used in, in chips today is essentially a modification of a wing sail that was really effectively developed in the America's Cup. Um, these work like a regular sail, but because they're a double-sided airfoil, they're more efficient um, and they can adjust their camber really effectively to produce different lift coefficients. We're going to talk, I'm going to use in this analysis, I'm going to use the, the wing sail because it's a little bit more widely applicable of a technology. Okay, now on to the ways of generating this analysis. The goal is to look at which vessel type that we've talked about is most will benefit most from putting wind propulsion devices on board. And typically will benefit most means is most cost effective or produces the best return on investment for the company that is doing, doing the work. So the first thing we're gonna look at is three different wind farm pairs. Vineyard wind off the coast of Martha's Vineyard, Empire Wind, which is just off the south shore of Long Island, and then Dominion in Virginia. And I've just done that because we want to look at more than just one project, because a project typically takes a year. And if you're going to retrofit a vessel, you need to get enough work to make the, the economics viable. So I've broken down the different vessel types that we talked about into general operational profiles, and then we'll get more specific in a second. The wind turbine installation vessel, foundation vessel, cable laying, and the SOV spend most of their time stationary, right? Which isn't the most effective vessel to put an alternative propulsion system on because they really just don't do that much propulsion. Um, if you're on a jackup, it would be a great idea to put a small turbine or some other system to capture the wind and use it to run your electricity loads, but you don't really benefit from propulsion. On the fixed route, we have the vessels that spend or do most of their work just going from the marshalling port out to the wind farm and then back. And they do that daily or a couple times a day or a couple times a week. And then the flexible route vessels are, are primarily survey vessels in the geo, I don't remember which one, physical or technical, <laughs> in the sonar solution where you're mapping the whole thing. And by flexible route here, I mean they have a place they have to go, but they can adjust their course to match the prevailing wind direction. So for this analysis, we're going to just look at crew transfer, OSV, feeder barge, and survey, uh, because there's no point in looking at the mostly stationary vessels. The guard vessels are really small. It's hard to envision an investment in wind propulsion tech. And I don't actually know where rock dump vessels go to get their rocks. Uh, okay, so in the analysis, to answer this question, the first thing we need to do is figure out what the wind is like on these routes. Marin, who's been a big part of this conference, has an awesome tool that's free and available and you should check out. It's called Blue Root. Uh, it doesn't have great search engine optimization, so you have to search exactly that. Um, they uses historical weather data called ERA5 reanalysis. What that means is they take a forecast model that you're used to to develop the weather we get every week and they feed into it the historical actual measured weather data. So from a weather station, feed that into the model and we get a more accurate, it's called reanalysis or hindcast that we can use as statistical data about what the wind speeds are in different areas, especially places that don't have wind sensors. So we we plot the vessel route, we run this analysis, and what we get is basically a, a statistical distribution of what the wind speeds and directions are like on this route. This is eight knot uh, ship speed apparent wind. You can see zero degrees represents the front of the ship. So most of the winds in this route are, you know, on the nose, which if you're a sailor, isn't great. So the first actual step of the math, um, if you are a sailor, you know apparent wind and true wind. For those that aren't converted to sailing yet, there's still time. 
like web will web will take you on that journey if you're interested. <laughs> True wind is the wind speed and direction that's experienced if you're stationary. Apparent wind is the vector sum of true wind speed plus your motion. So it's what you feel when you're on the boat and the boat's moving. It's also what the sail experiences. So it's very important that we figure out the apparent wind speed to figure out the sail lift thrust. So you take the wind speed and direction, we calculate apparent winds. And then with that apparent wind angle and speed, we look at the sail angle of attack and the sail lift and drag coefficients. Those are generated from computational fluid dynamics or wind tunnel testing. And they tell you basically how much thrust will you get out of a sail and what direction will it be. Now puts are the lift and drag forces, which are still relative to the sail position, right? If you're on a sailboat and you let the sail out, you know, the, the classic sailing terminology is let it out until it lofts, right? And then pull it back in a little bit. And the purpose of that is because you want this lift vector in green to be as close to the front of pointing in the direction you want to go as possible, right? So you always want to be sailing with the sail as far out as possible. So once we have the lift and drag forces, we resolve that into the coordinate system of the vessel. Now, I've made a few big simplifying assumptions here because this is a pretty high level analysis. We're assuming that we're only installing five to 15% wind propulsion on these vessels. And the reason to, to take that assumption is partially because the industry, especially in the US, isn't ready to go bigger than that or hasn't seen the value in going bigger than that. And partially because when you get only a small percentage of your thrust from wind, you don't have to worry that much about the leeway um, and the additional rudder angle to maintain your course, right? You still have propellers pushing you in that direction and the side, the hull can generate enough side force typically to resolve that. So yeah, this is a big assumption, but I, it's valid for this level of wind assistance. All right, and then we calculate the average thrust. Basically, that's just looking at a matrix of all of the wind speed and direction possibilities that came from the Blue Roots application. We've assumed a sail area, 200 square meters, because that's a rough size that will work on most of these vessel types. The converting thrust to power here, this is very vessel specific. I'm taking a, a pretty broad brush approach because we're looking at a bunch of different vessel types and we don't have access to the, you know, the propulsion coefficients. But for the roughness and the kind of high level analysis, this applies across the, all the vessels, so it's okay. Convert to power and then look at an average fuel type. These vessels are burning marine gas oil, so it's a little more expensive than, than HFO. All right, the most, perhaps the most important part of this actual analysis is looking at the operational profiles of the vessel. And the reason that's important is because when you're deploying a technology that saves fuel, it, it saves fuel every hour you're operating. So we need to know how many hours a year the vessels are operating so we can figure out how many years it will take to pay off the investment. The speeds are also important because the speed of the vessel tells us what the apparent wind speed is going to be. So the fixed routes are fixed route vessels, the crew transfer, the OSV and the feeder barge are typically making a one trip out or a, a trip out every two days. Uh, the survey vessel has a very different route, right? They're not going from port out to the wind farm. They're just staying out on the wind farm, driving back and forth until they finish their survey. And then they come in and they take a week off to reload the vessel or reposition to another wind farm. Obviously, this is very simple. This is just the distance out to the wind farm for the vessels on that route. And then we have the results in a not very well. Professor Harris would definitely dock me points for putting this many numbers on a slide. Um, the columns to pay attention to are operational time per year, thrust, and fuel savings dollars. So operational time per year is just the summation of the daily or the, the operational profile. And if we go back here, the other key thing to mention is yearly operation. Because of the environmental restrictions, some of these vessels don't actually operate in the right whale season. 
So they're just doing less hours or less months per year. So you can see survey has a ton more operational hours because their task is to motor around slowly. Uh, and the fuel savings are much better as a result. The thrust column tells us for that route, how effective is wind propulsion? So a higher number there means wind propulsion, you get more thrust for the same size sails. Lower number is the opposite. So you can see that the New York routes are on average, some of the worst. Um, and that's partially because of the direction from Brooklyn out to the wind farm. It's just not as much of a reaching course. Whereas the survey vessel can set up its transects to reach back and forth in, on each leg. CTVs are not great because they just go so fast, right? If you're going 24 knots, it takes a lot of wind in the right direction to make the wind not just be on your face. You've all felt that when you ride on a ferry or a you know, fishing vessel going fast. Um, at today's fuel costs, an installation or today's technology costs, an installation of 200 square meters of of sales solution is somewhere between a half million and a million dollars. Um, so if you're a survey vessel and you're saving a hundred to one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year, that's an attractive, simple payback for a ship owner. That's five, five to seven years, which is pretty good for this type of investment. Um, with current fuel costs, the feeder barge or the OSV who just aren't spending that much time in transit, probably not as exciting. Okay, that was the technical portion. Uh, now on to the advice. <laughs> this is a picture of me again. I have a lot of pictures of myself in here. <laughs> this is Justin is the one who's up close. He also graduated from Webb. This, so I put this picture in because the first or the second bullet came from him. Find a friend and do something challenging together outside your comfort zone. Uh, further from your comfort zone, the more you'll grow. Another piece of advice from Colin was set a life goal and work towards that. It doesn't matter if you change your goal, but it gives you something to, to evaluate decisions on. And then, you know, advocate for yourself. Right at when you're in school, you're being measured on the quality of your work. But once you go into a workplace, the quality is very important. But you also are in a human system where people have play favorites and all of that stuff. So you have to kind of stand up for yourself and and make your value known. And then what I've learned from from running this startup is just ask for help. Right, people. It's unbelievable how often somebody you have never met will say, yeah, I'll talk to you for 30 minutes and share my experience. And that's a great way to figure out which direction you want to go. Instead of spending six months of your life doing something, you can just download somebody's experience and uh, take that. And then, I, you know, spend time outside, right? It's the world that we're, we're, we're trying to make the world a better place. And so we should also enjoy the outdoors while we can. Thank you. Are there any questions? I guess it was very thorough. <laughs> yes. So, um, how would you account for um, the physical space on the decks taken up by wind propulsion for some of these systems that are like transport? That yeah, that's a, that's a you're right onto a key question, right? When we're looking at retrofitting ships, deck space is is really valuable. So. For certain ship types so you know the feeder barge that we showed that's generally because they're trying to put towers on upright that's often a stability limited vessel so deck space is not as much of a concern um, survey vessels similar thing they're towing stuff astern if you can work around their survey gear then deck space is a possibility yeah with the osvs we've talked to operators who say we just don't have room for that all right so in a retrofit case yeah, it's, a, it's an engineering challenge and it's tough because sometimes it's a vessel by vessel analysis. With a new build, there's a lot more opportunity to integrate sales into the vessel in a way that isn't a problem. Great, great question. So the requirements to uh, either retrain existing crew or bring on new crew to operate them this uh, be a substantial part of the, uh, the budget requirements for these 
<laughs> yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> you guys are right on to it. Um, I see why they let you in. Uh, <laughs> the, so, yeah, there, there's two lenses to that. It's an evolving question with class societies, how much automation these systems are going to be allowed to have and required to have, right? When you're putting 10 to 15% of your propulsion power from wind, you're not really starting to affect vessel stability in, in most types of vessels. Um, typically, you're just saying above this wind speed, you can't use the system. Uh, all of the systems that we work with are designed to control their you know, sail trim automatically because that's pretty easy. So the crew needs to treat the equipment like it's another, you know, it's like, it's very similar to a crane in terms of its mechanical functioning. So there's some additional training, but not, not a ton. In the future, when we put larger sail installations on ships, yeah, we're, we're looking at a new regime of how can stability be controlled, not just from a rule-based prescriptive approach, but how can we actually control it in real time? As you do on a small sailboat, right? If you're sailing a 420, you are the stability control. So we need to apply that same technology to ships. Yeah, who's up? Okay. Uh, so you said a lot of these ships have to be dynamically positioned. How would you incorporate sailing and wind power into dynamically positioned ships? That's a, yeah, um, great point. So if you, you know, dynamic position is two things. It's controlling location and heading. Uh, it's very hard to control location with sails because you just get pushed sideways. They're very good at controlling heading, right? Traditionally, lobster fishermen have used a small sail on the boat, both to control roll and to keep the boat pointed into the wind when they're hauling their trap by themselves. So we haven't done the analysis yet. I do think there's an opportunity to use the sails to maintain heading and reduce the amount of repositioning the thrusters have to do so that you can just hold position with thrusters and heading with the sails. But if anybody wants to do a thesis on that, you should, it would be a cool thing to look into. Um, obviously, you chose wind as your alternative uh, source of power because that's you know, just your passion. But uh, is there any reason why you think that's the best alternative? Great, great question. I don't think wind is the only, we're not, we're, I'm not talking, I'm not suggesting we only use wind. Mm -hmm. Um, you really teed me. I didn't pay him to ask this question. <laughs> yeah. Um, wind, wind is really nice because we can deploy it today. It, we're not waiting on fuel infrastructure to be built on the land side or people to figure out the chemical processes to make ammonia more efficiently, right? You can put wind on and save fuel tomorrow. Um, I think in the future, you know, when we go back to this analysis, uh, if I can, you know, the fuel price is what's driving the payback period, right? And I haven't heard a single person say zero emissions fuels are going to be cheaper. And so most people say two to five times more expensive. And that's a pretty big range. But at two times more expensive, these fuel savings numbers just double, right? So you, you are looking at a technology that really has the potential to increase its return on investment in the future. So yeah, not the only solution, definitely paired with others, but right now it's the one we can deploy. Yeah. So you mentioned that the payback period for those who are doing asking be five to seven years, and that's a very attractive time period. For the other vessels, would it be a similar return or would it be a lot longer? Would people still opt for that option? Yeah, uh, right. So I mean, the payback period math, I guess I sh should have included the column noted. Uh, it's essentially just, cost of the system, a, a simple payback math is just cost of the system divided by savings per year, right? So if we have a half million dollar system, four and a half years for the survey vessel, 10 years, did I do that math right? I don't think I did. Longer than 10 years for the feeder barge, for instance. Um, so it depends. This is something we've talked to a lot of ship owners and operators about. In general, ship owners want to invest in green technology. They're excited about that. And they want to be a better business for the world. Um, what they need is their customers who charter the vessel or who carry cargo on the vessel to demand that and to be willing to offer something in return. Um, so as, you know, Paul, as Paulo was saying Monday morning, I don't know if you were here for that lecture. 
uh, they've really made that work by partnering with the charters. Um, yeah, so so uh, I don't know. The offshore wind industry is is pretty green leaning in terms of you know compared to oil and gas, for instance. But are they willing to pay for that? They're probably not willing to pay for something that has a ten year payback period right now. Uh, so it's kind of going off with the deep question. They're working under these turbines, in these wind fields. Do the turbines have any effect on the wind that these vessels will see once they're in the field? And how would that be for making this another vessel? That's a that's the question that I have not analyzed at all. Um, yeah, we don't. I don't know if we know what the. I'm sure there's some people at you know National Renewable Energy Lab who know what the effect of the wind is going to be, and I'm sure the racing sailors who race in and around these turbines are going to figure that out pretty quickly. But yeah, I don't. I don't really know. Um, yeah, I think the, you know, so the vessels that are going to be in the farm all of their life, that may be a concern for. Finn. Um, so about how long does it take to like outfit a ship with the sail? Like, does that factor into the payback period? Or yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So the, the downtime, if you have to take a ship out of service to do a retrofit that you weren't originally planning to do, that's extra, you know, extra bad for payback. Um, so we're focused on mod developing modular systems that can be installed without major shipyard retrofit periods. Um, that's only going to work up to a certain size range, right? Up to a, in, in the larger size range, we're going to need to integrate with whole structure to be cost effective. And so that trade-off, we don't, we don't know yet where that trade-off happens. We're kind of pushing up to the, to the limit on that. So we really have a lot of established sailing equipment that we uh, that we know works, you know, like bay, or twenties, whatever. Do you foresee any newer equipment that needs to be developed in order to make this a more attractive way of powering these vessels? Yeah, I mean, so what what we're working on now is a is a prototype for the wing sail itself, um, and the reason we're working on that is because the traditional, you know, canvas sails or cloth sails are great, but they're very human in their control, right? It's, it's hard to automate all of the things that go into trimming one of those sails and, and especially putting it up and putting it down. And for the operators on commercial ships who are worried about risk and worried about crew training, you need a system that can handle that stuff. So that's why the, the three systems I showed, the rigid wing sail, the flat and rotor, the suction sail are all um, easier to integrate in that sense. <laughs> As for stuff that needs to be developed, yeah, I mean, there's a ton of like different things that need to be developed. We're working on the stability integration stuff. There's all kinds of control systems problems, right? As you, you know, adjusting and controlling the thrust from the sails so that they're not fighting against the rudder and the existing ship control systems. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. We're going to go to Vicky. Satchel. Um, since the U.S. is kind of a little late to the game on offshore wind period um, and a little late to the game on wind propulsion period, uh, are any other countries looking at wind power for their installation vessel, uh, offshore wind? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, not that I know of. You know, we started looking into this primarily because it's just wind farms are wind, built in windy places, right? It's like, if you're going to put wind propulsion on a ship, you don't have to spend a ton of time figuring out whether it's windy. You know, this is, this is a windy location. Um, yeah, there's been a big push in Europe to decarbonize the vessels that are operating the wind farms because they have a 30-year life in the wind farm. Um, the developers of the projects can kind of say, well, the carbon we release in performing the construction is... Uh, paid back by the wind farms electricity in about two years, which is not insignificant in the, over the life of the farm. So yeah, I don't know of any any wind propulsion installations focusing on this. Maybe after Europe watches this presentation, they'll get after it too. Uh, David, David. Uh, yeah, have you looked at any subsidies that are huge factors of that even making the wind farm economically viable? Yeah, so. Yeah, great question. Um, in Europe, a lot of the, the wind propulsion technology uptake was driven by 
European Union subsidies so far. In the US, we have a couple of different things. So um, in the IRA, you can get a tax credit for building a vessel or retrofitting a vessel that is green. There's also MARAD financing available for vessels of special interest, of which vessels working in wind farms are designated. Uh, and that's a great way for people to get really low interest financing to do a retrofit like this. Um, there's not, you know, the U.S. doesn't, hasn't funded uh, commercial shipping development a ton in that way. So that's, yeah, that's definitely a, another place where we're, we're lagging behind Europe. I'm going to switch your vector a little bit. You're a co-founder of this firm. Can you tell me a little bit about your uh, revenue strategy? How are you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, you know, we're part of an accelerator in Boston called See Ahead. Uh, and they give us some investment money. We, as part of that program, we spend a lot of our time talking to customers about potential customers, ship owners and operators, about what their challenges are with decarbonization, with general operating strategy, what their challenges are working in the wind industry um, and how we can help. And so essentially our, our strategy is to find the niche that is valuable. So you're looking for consulting or intellectual property or what? Yeah, we, well, we intend to be a, a an equipment provider at this point. Uh, I'm open to, if you have business, send it my way. <laughs> See ahead is Mark Wong. See ahead is Mark Wong, yeah, Web, web uh, 80, 88. 88, yeah. It's a great guy. Dean Warner. You mentioned the percent power coverage mostly on factor dealing with this new asset. If we if we flip that and say, all right, let's go with new vision. Is there a point where we that we need to get to in terms of amount of propulsion power from the sale that we can get significant savings above and beyond a sort of traditional adaptation policy? I, I think I understand the question. We did a lot of work on this initiative before this called uh, AUTF, which is a group of French cargo owners who ship containers to the US. And they put out a tender for a container service uh, that was 50% propulsion from wind, 50% carbon reduction against the average on that trade lane. Uh, but they only guaranteed 500 containers a week. Most ships operating on the North Atlantic trade lane are 4,500 to 10,000 TEU. And so to get to a 50% reduction against that economies of scale vessel meant we actually ended up reducing the emissions from the des designed vessel by 85%. Uh, and that was also a retrofit, but pushing the lines of retrofit and new build, right? We were you know, completely changing the ship. Um, so yeah, depending on where you're operating, it's very feasible to get 80% of your, you know, 80% emissions reduction from an identical size ship. Um, primary, that, yeah, go keep it. with that, you, you get the ability to produce, say, traditionally uh, installed power? Yeah, oh, ma massively, right? The, you know, that's it. We're reducing ship speeds as part of that. But in that simulation, <laughs> we were actually looking at how can we retrofit the ship and you know, do we just take cylinders off the engine, right? We need to be able to operate at way lower than this two-stroke is is optimized for. Um, we're looking at electrical power take-in systems. Yeah, you know, <laughs> the speed is not your friend when it comes to emissions reductions. Um, and so much smaller engines, yeah, is a great way to go. Or diesel electric, any, any power plant that allows you to reduce speed or sail in a part of your thrust from wind, part of your thrust from... The propulsion system, absolutely. But that makes retrofitting very hard. David. Yeah, you, you mentioned it earlier as well that like the weather profile is such a big thing in the wind power and like offshore in general. And there's a lot of work that goes into trying to increase that uptime, trying to you know, uh, get us as much out of that. How does the industry, your experience, if we talk to like responsible for volatility with? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting when I, when I talk to them, the, the part that they are, that they completely believe is that putting wind propulsion on the ship will save them fuel, right? Nobody seems to doubt that. 
the number one concern is deck space. Um, and yeah, you know, maybe the number two concern is this is more complicated. This is going to reduce my flexibility. But, you know, when we talk about you're not going to change your route and you're not going to change your speed, then they're generally pretty okay with that, right? The systems we're talking about are only operating when they're adding thrust in a useful way. The rest of the time, they're just folding down. The next level of savings, like the example I was giving, Dean Warner, that's where you optimize your route. And that's really where we start to see large savings, but that's much less, people we've talked to are much less willing to do that within their existing operational models, which is a big, that's a big challenge, right? Great, thank you. Oh. Uh, from Jamie Greenleaf, uh, we're going exclusively to electric propulsion. Keep within the basic effort to go completely renewable and efficient freight. Power can come from the turbines and be generated by wind. Yeah, so there's an initiative to do this, and I think it's a great solution for some of those mostly stationary vessel types we talked about. Right? Um, there's actually work being done to build a floating buoy that connects to the turbine electrical system, and so you're just getting you know free green electricity right out of the wind farm. So for the vessels that are going to, like the service operating vessel that's going to spend its whole life sitting next to it, one turbine or the another, that's great. That vessel should, there's no, like, if we can get a, two of those buoys in every wind farm, that vessel doesn't need any diesel engines. Perf, you know, perfect example. For the, in the construction process, when the turbines aren't there, we need a different solution. Awesome. Thank you.